verse number <coughs> one, please, of Revelation and chapter number 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. <clears throat> and again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke grows up for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And perhaps one final verse earlier on in the book of Romans. And chapter 8, uh, book of Romans, and chapter number 8, and verse number 18, uh, which says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's just ask for God's help, shall we? Our Father, we come again at a very difficult part of the Word of God, and we pray, Father, for grace. Uh, we know, Father, these words are given by thy Spirit, and we pray, Father, that thy <coughs> same gracious Holy Spirit who gave them would be very gracious to us this evening in open, opening them up to us uh, with a, a blessing, a sense of thy presence. Uh, guidance and help, Father, as we do pray, Father, for that help in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There is a word that appears in your Bibles, particularly in the Old Testament of your Bibles, uh, a word that has uh, come down into English unaltered from the ancient Hebrew. In fact, a word that you will find in all languages unaltered, uh, that have come into contact with the Bible. It's that word that you and I uh, still use today, Alleluia. It is, of course, a Hebrew word. It means praise ye the Lord or praise the Lord. Uh, almost invariably, it occurs at the beginning or the end of a song. It occurs particularly in the book of Psalms. 24 times in the book of Psalms it occurs at the beginning and at the end of, of, of those Psalms. It's really a way of giving thanks to God for the greatness and the glory of who he is. Uh, from the Old Testament up until Revelation chapter 18, you won't read of it at all in the New Testament. Not at all. That word does not appear at all in the New Testament until you get to Revelation chapter 19. And it's in this chapter that you will find the last four hallelujahs of the Bible and the only four hallelujahs that you will have in the New Testament of the Scriptures. And of course, in Revelation chapter number 19, it appears that God has kept those last four hallelujahs before forever uh, for one very particular purpose. Now, I have deliberately moved on from the subject of Babylon in chapter 18 uh, for this reason, or for one uh, particular reason, that 
Uh, I feel that perhaps last time we got a kind of a sense of what Babylon was all about. Do you remember that? And, and I want you to remember what Babylon was all about because it's really relevant for what we're reading here in Revelation chapter number 19. Let me remind you that the Babylon of chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation in essence is the world that you and I know. Uh, it comes to uh, its fulfillment in these chapters, but in essence, it's that world that you and I know, but worked on a bit more by Satan, perfected a bit more by the devil for his nefarious, uh, his uh, wicked uh, 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 personal purposes. It is a world of commerce and complexity. It's a world of deep immorality. It is a world uh, of entertainment. It was the world of media. Do you remember that? It was also the world of commerce. It was the world of banking and of finance. It was the world where you might find your security. And I think uh, uh, my, my judgment would be from these chapters that that was one of the pretexts and under which Babylon, in fact, was founded to guarantee a kind of a world security. And it seemed to provide that. It brought kings and uh, nations together, for example. What could be better, you say, than a United Nations that would guarantee world security? Well, it was all there in Babylon. Everything that perhaps you and I might associate with the world today and everything that the people of Revelation 17, 18 and perhaps two of those people who we now find in Revelation 19 knew about all and uh, knew about the world. It's all there in Babylon. But at the beginning of chapter 19, we're looking back on a scene. It's a scene of utter devastation, complete and utter destruction. It's a scene in which the flames ascend high into the atmospheres of earth from Babylon as the judgment of God falls upon it and it is utterly destroyed. The air of this world is thick, heavy, black and, in, and, and impenetrable with the fire and the flames that arise from Babylon. It is a scene of utter destruction, devastation and judgment. And as men and women look down upon that scene from heaven, there is a word that arises four times in Revelation chapter 19. You might find it a somewhat inappropriate word. Maybe a word that is a little out of place. It kind of struck me as somewhat unusual, I have to say. But as these people, let me remind you, people like you and I, Revelation chapter 19 and 1, after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. These are people who are saved, people who for the best part of their life, for the beginnings of their life, looked out at that world round about them, perhaps as you and I do, and what they saw was certainty. What they saw was a world that seemed to be so safe and so secure, a world that seemed to be unchangeable, immovable. They were in the minority. <laughs> they were the underdogs. It seemed that the politicians, it seemed uh, that the famous and the rich had the upper hand. It seemed that that system out there was there forever. And yet one of the great surprises of Revelation chapter 18 associated with Babylon is that it fell. But an even greater surprise is contained there within verse 17 of Revelation 18. Not only did it fall, but it fell in one hour. It fell so quickly. Let me remind our hearts uh, tonight that the world that you and I know, the only world that you and I have ever experienced, the world that seems permanent, <coughs> immovable, unchangeable, a world that is resistant to anything uh, to do with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that rejects the morality and the uh, Christian teaching of the word of God, that world will fall. And it will fall incredibly quickly. Now, one hour may be a metaphor, but even if it is a metaphor, it emphasizes how fast this world will fall. It reminds me of the words of Jim Elliot that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Jim Elliot, who was killed uh, as a missionary in South America uh, over 50 years ago. And uh, in his writings prior to heading out to South America, he wrote um, about uh, the choice that he had made, uh, that uh, uh, this world is a world that's very much changing and passing. Uh, you cannot have both heaven and earth as your part and as your portion. A wise man chooses that which lasts the longest. That was a wise decision. Eh? You cannot have both heaven and earth as your part and as your portion. To the, the ordinary eye, as you and I look out on this world, we see that world as being pretty secure, safe, permanent, and, and as being the certain thing. You cannot have both heaven and earth as your part and as your portion. A wise man chooses that 
which lasts the longest. And in these chapters here, I don't know if Jim Elliott had been reading these chapters, but you can certainly write it above these chapters. In these chapters here, the truth of that statement is so clearly and graphically illustrated as the Babylon that you and I know passes away in one hour in chapter 18. And what is left is the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, says the Saviour. Uh, it is uh, that which is there that gives value and meaning and purpose to the Christian life. It is that that has enduring value. It's not worth, is it? It's really not worth uh, comparing these present uh, afflictions to that eternal weight of glory, as the Apostle Paul has said. Well, against those flames ascending from the fallen Babylon, uh, against that thick, black, impenetrable smoke, that is rising, there is this sound in heaven. And four times in Revelation chapter 19, four times the response of heaven is this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know, would that be our response to a world that has come under the judgment of God? I wonder. Hallelujah. It's sobering to think, isn't it? Maybe we would find that our our roots actually are there in our world. Maybe we would find and perhaps we would judge that our affections lie there, maybe in the world. Maybe we would be reluctant to sing hallelujah. But uh, in those days, we will fall into one of three categories. And it's the same three categories that you read of back in Genesis chapter 19. As the fire fell in a smaller way on two cities, not in the whole world, but on two cities in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, People were divided into three groups. There was a group that was caught in Sodom and Gomorrah and that fell under the fire, the flame and the judgment of God and were consumed. And there was a very small group, Lot and his two daughters, that were saved out of that fire. And they were thankful for it. I'm sure they were thankful for it. And then there was a middle group. Do you remember that middle group? A rather strange middle group. A middle group uh, consisting of one person, in fact, Lot's wife who had the opportunity to be saved, who had an opportunity to leave it behind. But actually, the aspirations deep within their heart lay in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember that she looked back. Now, it's interesting, if you do go back to Genesis chapter 19, you'll find that uh, uh, Lot's wife looks back uh, over that uh, scene of devastation, and she's turned to a pillar of salt because her aspirations, her heart lies there. But if you just look a few verses later on, in fact, why don't you come with me? Maybe just to show you this, just so, just in case you think I'm making it up. I know you wouldn't ever think I would make anything up. But anyway, uh, Genesis chapter number 19. Let's go back to that um, uh, scene of devastation. <clears throat> uh, Genesis uh, chapter number 19. And uh, we're, we'll go to the end of the section, really, uh, verse 25, the scene of devastation. We won't read the details, but just to get to the bottom line, in a sense, of where our thoughts are, Genesis nineteen twenty-five, And he, God, overthrew those cities, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back. From behind him, that's Lot's wife, and she became a pillar of salt. But look what it says in the next couple of verses. Verse 27, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah. That's interesting, isn't it? You see, just a minute, that's not very fair. Uh, how come Lot's wife looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, and she could turn to a pillar of salt, and Abraham, he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, and he did it. It's just double standards, is it? No, not at all. It reflects, of course, uh, two very different attitudes. It wasn't actually the look that was the issue. It was the aspiration. It was what, it's, it's, it's what motivated the look. There was Lot's wife, and she was looking back at who she had left there and what she had left there and the roots that she had there and the desire that she... She was sorry that Sodom and Gomorrah was getting destroyed. That's why she looked back. Abraham looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and he saw something of the terrible power, the omnipotence, uh, the awful justice and righteousness of God. He saw something there that, that just established in his heart that, you know what? God's word is true. This is the prophetic word fulfilled that the angels gave to me 
And he saw something of the power of God, something of the righteousness of God, something of the salvation of God and the saving of Lot, and something too there uh, in what had been poured out upon that terrible place of God's divine righteousness and judgment. Well, ah, you fall into one of three groups. You're either part of the judgment, or you're saved from it, or you had an opportunity to flee. But in heart or in reality, you stay and you too fell under that judgment. In Revelation chapter number 19, uh, here we have in heaven uh, the final four hallelujahs of those that look back over that scene of devastation. And they fall into that third group, that group that Lot fell into back in Genesis 19. These are those that have been saved out of, away from that fire and that destruction. And from them comes Hallelujah. Uh, verse number one, let me highlight it to you. Verse one, uh, the, a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Verse number three, and again they said, Hallelujah. Verse number four, God that sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And verse number six, the last half there, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Looking out on that terrible scene of catastrophe, disaster, destruction and judgment the hallelujahs arise in heaven above the smoke of the furnace of earth maybe in a sense maybe in a sense just a little uh, a little echo maybe of what had happened so often in the old testament days maybe a little echo of those many hallelujahs that rung out through the earthly temple and tabernacle as the fragrance uh, of the incense smoked up through that place uh, in the face of the priest as he recited those psalms. Hallelujah, he would say. And the smoke would arise. Maybe there's a connection. I wonder if there is a connection that actually the praise and the worship of God is intimately connected to his judgment and his justice. Well, the scene of devastation. I wonder. I wonder if you would say hallelujah if you saw such a scene. Well, Revelation chapter 19 tells us that that's what happens, but not only does it tell us that that's what happened, but it tells us why it happened. And here's three reasons for these four hallelujahs that you have in Revelation chapter 19. Now, I have said so often that as we fall, as we work our way through the book of Revelation, there are parts of this book that are too good to leave to prophecy, and we have to take them and apply them to our own hearts. And I'm going to encourage uh, my heart and maybe your heart too to take uh, this picture. It's the picture of the end times, of course, of the great big picture of divine judgment. But to take it and read it uh, in the light of a verse like Romans 8 and verse 18, uh, which brings it practically to us. And Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. In other words, listen, as you pass through the sufferings, the trials, the difficulties, the afflictions, the problems, the pains of this world, God can and God does do something for your blessing and for his eternal glory. I was at a, a little kind of a party uh, uh, just a few days ago, a farewell party, and I got in conversation uh, with one of the uh, gentlemen that were there. And uh, as part and parcel of the conversation, uh, uh, we discussed a little bit about what we did. And I was very impressed by what he did. He, he had walked all of them on roads. And uh, I found that very impressive because I'm scared of heights. And uh, that was very interesting to hear. And so he asked me, what do you do? And, uh, well, I told him about my job. And I told him I do a little bit of speaking at times, uh, uh, whilst uh, uh, on a Sunday night at times and, and so forth. And, and we got on to the conversation of that subject, often referred to as God. Um, he had an interesting take on God. And his take on God was this. I'm not so sure about God, he said. Um, my mother died in her 50s and uh, she had a terrible illness. And my sister died young as well. He said, I'm just not so sure about the idea of a God. I'm not, I'm not sure at all about someone who's there to make sure everything works well and, and uh, everything is looked after on earth. 
Me neither. Me neither. That's not the God that the Bible talks about. Somebody that's a caretaker for earth, that makes sure everything works smoothly and runs well. I don't believe in that God either. I couldn't believe in that God for five minutes. <laughs> as soon as you open your news feed, you couldn't believe in a God like that, could you? Uh, and if you really want to see just how, how abstract, if you like, God is from this terrible world, you come to these chapters. Because the ultimate final verdict of God is the pouring out of judgment that endures forever upon this world. He takes this world and he ultimately incinerates it. And as the flames and fire and smoke arise, from heaven comes, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Now, it's not that God is callous and not that his people are uncaring. And neither is it that his uh, angelic hosts in Revelation chapter 19 ha are heartless. But there are three great reasons in Revelation chapter number 19 for these hallelujahs. Let us very briefly just notice them. They are, I think, the same aspirations that Abraham had, interestingly, in Revelation, in Genesis chapter 19. The first of them there is in verse number one. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor. Mm. The first reason that those hallelujahs go up in heaven is this, an appreciation of God's salvation. An appreciation of God's salvation. It is in that moment in Revelation chapter 19 that we will fully know what it means to be saved from the wrath to come. Once we see that wrath, then we'll appreciate what that actually means. I find it difficult to conceptualize in my mind what it actually means to be saved from wrath to come, what it actually means to be saved from eternal judgment. What does it actually mean to be saved from hell, from the lake of fire? What does it actually mean to be saved from the condemnation of a holy God whose eyes cannot behold iniquity, who's of purer eyes and to behold my sin? What does it mean to be saved from that? Well, here, these men and women in heaven in Revelation 19, verse number one, can see it. We're saved. There's something to give praise and thanks for. That is surely is the, uh, is the sentiment that you, that you see time and time again, don't you? Right the way through the Old Testament scriptures. As, for example, the nation of Israel comes out of Egypt. Death and destruction and the plagues fall upon that nation of Egypt, utterly decimating it. And then uh, the, the sea comes uh, over Pharaoh and his armies, draw, drowning and destroying it. And But for 40 years up from that people, there comes praise and worship. They build a tabernacle, in fact, to fill with the praises of the Lord. That's where the hallelujahs go up. For 40 years in the wilderness, it is constant praise and thanksgiving. Not so much because God destroyed Egypt, and not, not necessarily because God drowned the armies of Pharaoh, but because they're saved, they're saved, they're saved from slavery, <coughs> from slavery. Slave, saved from being serfs in, in Egypt and saved that they might go out into the wilderness and to serve the Lord their God. Let my people go, said God through Moses, that they may serve me. Praise and thanksgiving. Can I remind you too that that great gospel text, that great good news text that we often hear quoted, sometimes even preached on just as a single verse, salvation is of the Lord and many places of worship uh, gospel halls in particular often choose that as a text for the platform it's a great text salvation is of the Lord but it doesn't come from the writings of the apostle Paul that I often associate with the gospel it doesn't even come from the words of the Lord Jesus who, of course, is the very source and origin of the gospel. And it doesn't come from John, a man who has a deep understanding of the heart of God that beats through the gospel. It came from Jonah. And Jonah, of course, had that unique experience of being saved from the judgment of God. He utters that verse, salvation is of the Lord, just as the uh, great fish is about to vomit him out uh, from the depths of the uh, mucky waters of where he thought was hell itself, onto dry land. Salvations of the Lord. This is hallelujah. Hallelujah, why? He was swallowed, no. It's hallelujah because he was saved. And, and it is as these 
uh, believers uh, in heaven in Revelation 19 look out of that look out over that scene of utter decimation through the thick, deep, dark uh, pools of smoke arising from earth that they see finally from what they've been saved. I wonder. I wonder if we appreciate from what we've been saved. Sometimes we get a little taste of it, don't we? As we come into contact with men and women day by day and we see the disasters and catastrophes of their life and we see the mess and the sadness and the sorrow and maybe we get a little flavour that we've, in a sense, been saved from that. But we've been saved from something far greater than just the mess of this world. To be saved from the judgment of God. Hallelujah. Secondly, if I can highlight too a little later on, uh, that to this, these hallelujahs arise not only as an appreciation of God's salvation, but also an appreciation of God's great righteousness uh, and his judgment. Verse 2 of Revelation chapter number 19. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and a smoke grows up forever and ever. How often have you and I heard the accusation made against God? Well, if there is a God, why does he not? How often have we heard that? If there's a God, why does he not judge? If there's a God, why does he not deal with such and such a person, somebody like Putin or so, or, or so forth? But why doesn't God intervene in judgment? And so often mankind has had that as a, uh, as a kind of a resentment, as a, as a gripe against the God of heaven. And here in Revelation chapter 19, the hallelujahs go up because God has finally and fully acted in perfect judgment. And he, he has dealt with all of this world and its sin. But to deal, you see, with all of this world and its sin means to deal with all of this world. And it's not as many uh, often consider that to deal with this world and its sin is to deal with one or two. But to deal with a world and its sin is to deal with it all. And in so doing, he has, for example, at the end of verse number two, avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And so the praise and the hallelujah ascends from heaven. That God, first of all, uh, God, first of all, uh, is a God of salvation. And secondly, he's a God of judgment. He hasn't let the sin and the rebellion, uh, the wickedness of this world go. He has dealt with it, finally. And fully. And then, thirdly, as uh, this world, uh, or heaven looks on, I should say, at this world, and these hallelujahs arise, maybe we could be encouraged by that final statement there in verse number 10. And this, I'm sure, is uh, very interesting indeed, uh, verse number 10. Maybe I, I could kind of draw a parallel here by way of explanation or illustration from that experience that we read back in Genesis uh, chapter number 19. You'll remember the fire that fell there uh, on that uh, on that scene. Um, if you were to go back maybe with me would you to to the book of Genesis. Let's just flick back to the to the book of, of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18 uh, to fill you in a little bit uh, with the story behind the story. Genesis chapter number 18. And in Genesis chapter 18, uh, Abraham has some visitors. Uh, it would appear uh, two angels and uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, I, I would say, uh, from the way that Abraham addresses the three visitors. He addresses one as my Lord and uh, the one who is my Lord uh, is, uh, seems to be distinctive uh, from the other two. So three visitors, one referred to as my Lord. Uh, that would perhaps indicate, as many have suggested over the years, that we have a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord Jesus, a Christophany, if you like. And it's interesting that out of these three visitors who come to, uh, to, to Abraham in Genesis 18, only two of them go to Sodom and Gomorrah. So it would appear that perhaps the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, doesn't go there, but the angels do. But anyway, these visitors appear to Abraham. They bring, of course, the promise of a son, uh, which is uh, to be fulfilled. Uh, you remember Sarah's uh, response, uh, verse 13 of Genesis 18, as they give, him, give uh, Abraham and Sarah the promise of a son. Uh, or verse 10 is the promise. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according 
to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And uh, Sarah laughs, of course, in verse 13 of Genesis 18. But uh, as well as that good news that these angels bring, if you were just to drop down a little bit into Genesis chapter number 18, uh, you would find uh, verse 19 of Genesis 18. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, uh, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence uh, and went towards Sodom, and Abra but Abraham stood before uh, the Lord. So Abraham has this uh, uh, announcement of the angelic visitation of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, God is going, or his angels are going, uh, in a sense, to judge that place. And as uh, Abraham, the next time we meet Abraham, uh, is Genesis chapter 19. He looks out over Sodom and Gomorrah, a place marked by homosexuality uh, and sexual immorality. They try and rape the uh, angels, in fact. But Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 27, where we read uh, earlier on, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up <coughs> as the smoke of a furnace. Is there any hallelujah in that? Is there anything I can take away from that that might be an encouragement? Anything I could apply to my life that might be an encouragement? Well, how about the summary of it in Revelation 19 and 10? And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. There are three great causes of these hallelujahs in Revelation chapter number 19. First of all, salvation. We can all give thanks for that, can't we? Save from the wrath to come. That's easy to apply. Secondly, God's justice and righteousness. God isn't slack concerning his promises. He doesn't let men away with wickedness. He will judge. It may be in his own time, but he will judge. And thirdly, the third truth I think we can take out and apply to our own hearts is this. God's word is reliable. What God says, he will do it. It seems to be that that imparted itself and impressed itself so much in Abraham. First of all, in Genesis 18, God said he would judge. And the next time we see Abraham, he observes that God has judged. Wow. And, and, and not just a wee bit. The whole thing has gone up in smoke under the judgment of God. One thing that we can take, I think, not only from these verses, but the whole of the book of Revelation, and in fact the whole of the Bible, if you like, is this, the, the reliability of the prophetic word. The reliability of the word of God. The reliability uh, that is inherent in what God says. What God says he will do. That's something surely that encourages all of our hearts. As we look back over scripture and, and you say, well, I'm saved. I've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. Are you sure you're saved? How do you know you're saved? How do you know he's the Lord and Saviour? Well, uh, the word of God tells me, the word of God tells me that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son, and, and, and she did. The word of God tells me that God would send his son as a lamb to the slaughter, and, 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 and he did. The word of God tells me that he who knew no sin would bear my sin upon his own body upon the tree. He'd be led as that lamb. He would be uh, wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquities. His resurrection is written there in the book of Psalms a thousand years before he came, and he was raised again from the dead. It's all there in the Old Testament scriptures. The place of his birth, the time of his death, the means of his execution, the means of his resurrection, uh, the deity of the person of the Lord Jesus, and a hundred other details concerning his birth, his betrayal, and so forth. All there in the Old Testament. What God says is what God does, and that gives me absolute confidence in the God of heaven that saved me. He's dependable. Isaiah put it like this. He's the God who declares the end from the beginning. 
Yeah, you'll find that hard to do. <laughs> you'll find it hard, won't you, to declare what your end will be or what my end will be from the beginning of your, of your life. Okay. We don't know anything about tomorrow, let alone the end of our life. But our God is a God whose word is utterly reliable. And in these verses in Revelation chapter number 19, the God who has said that he will judge is the God who judges. The God who said he's long-suffering uh, towards us, that none should perish, but uh, ultimately that God who will uh, bring this world to its conclusion, the God who has appointed a man uh, who will judge this world in righteousness, he fulfills his word. He does. He does. The God who said that the world uh, will pass away, but my words will not pass away, he's kept his words. He's kept his words. He's utterly reliable. And that God of Revelation chapter number 19 is that God whom we know by a very personal name. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Those hallelujahs, 24 of them in the book of Psalms, uh, many other aspirations of praise and worship in the Old Testament, and these four hallelujahs of Revelation chapter number 19 uh, are, of course, hallelujahs. They are, what they are praise to Yah, to Yah, alleluia, praise to Yah. And the Yah that you and I know is Jesus, Yahshua, uh, God saves. And all of those hallelujahs in the Old Testament are in, are in effect praise and worship to our Lord Jesus. These hallelujahs in Genesis and Revelation 19 are praise and worship to the Lord Jesus. His word is utterly reliable. Let's depend upon it. Our Father, we come into thy presence uh, this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee, our Father, that in the midst of devastation, destruction, judgment and uh, suffering and sorrow, we, we can see, our Father, that uh, uh, there is cause for praise. We thank thee for our salvation. We thank thee that we are saved from the wrath to come. Uh, we thank thee, our Father, that thou art a God who, uh, whilst men may accuse thee of being slow in judgment, uh, thou art a God who will keep his word and will judge this world in righteousness by the man whom thou hast appointed, the Lord Jesus. And we thank thee, our Father, that in that uh, great power thou art a God who is utterly reliable uh, according to thy word. We thank thee, our Father, that the spirit of the Lord Jesus is that spirit of prophecy. What is said, he will do. And we can depend, our Father, upon it. We thank thee that we can depend upon the prophecies of Old Testament days that declared the birth of the Lord Jesus, the death of the Lord Jesus, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, the betrayal of the Lord Jesus, the deity of the Lord Jesus. All of that declared and it came to pass. And we thank thee, our Father, that we can depend upon that same word to save. I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that word, our Father, uh, that was given, that promised the coming of the Lord Jesus, is the same word that promises salvation from him. And we thank thee, our Father, that we can rest upon thee, uh, our strength. And uh, uh, we thank thee, our Father, thou art indeed our strength and our defender. We offer thanks for the word of God this evening. We pray that thou bless it to each of our hearts as we offer thanks.